I call him, I call him our mentor because he's taught a lot of people. He's still teaching. He's still impacting lives all over the world. So may I give the honor again to whom it is indeed due to, <laughs> sir, Dr. Faith. It's back to you again to please welcome our mentor. Thank you, sir. Thank, thank you, Vivian, for passing that ball to me. And that's a, that was a very good pass. Um, thank you so much. I want to, um, while you were doing that, I was checking through to see if my mentor and uh, my boss is already seated. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm scanning through and uh, uh, boss, wherever you are, if you could hear from me, I don't know the name you joined. I'm trying to check through and I've not been able to see him. Okay. Uh, I'm trying to be sure that he's here before, prior to his introduction. Professor on BBC Kikwe, um, is a, is, is, I, we call him the Iroko of Africa. That's what I call him. He's a, he's a big fish, not the regular fish. <laughs> he's a big fish. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, Prof, are you, are you here? If Prof is not here, uh, I would, um, I would want to pass the ball to you, but let me, let me confirm that the next guest speaker is seated. Okay. Okay. I'm trying to confirm that. And I'm also in talks trying to chat up Prof whether he has joined or whether he's trying to join now. Okay, so while we wait for, while we wait for Prof, I'll, I'll put it back to you, um, Vivian, so you can keep holding us on. It's Harold around. No. Go ahead, I'll give you a signal in two, three minutes. Just keep okay. holding on. Yeah, I'll come back to you. Okay, sir. Let me verify, yes. Okay. Thank you. So everyone, may I say something? I heard of a particular question recently that borders on emotional intelligence. And I thought, you know, at some point you just feel, look, these questions, yes, I can pass, I know it, you know? <laughs> Simple question, but a lot of us failed on that question. And the question is this, which of these would you say, and while I say the questions, please feel free to drop your, your answers you know, right there on the chat box, either A or B. Which of these would you say you were taught by your parents when you were growing up? Which of these would you say your parents taught you? Is it how to manage your emotion or how to suppress it? I'd love to see your answers, A or B. And while we are on that, I would pass the ball to Shreville. Do you have something to say? Shrevi, what do you know about, um, would you rather suppress your emotions or manage them? I mean, naturally. I would rather you? manage the, I would rather manage the emotions rather than suppress it because if I suppress it, there's a time that's coming that, uh, they'll overwhelm me. I'm seeing how people are taught by their parents managing and suppressing these days in these current times um, toxic masculinity is teaching men how to suppress their emotions <laughs> oh my god okay so you are passing it on to the guys 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 in the house please are, are you going to allow her to say that suppressing is more on maybe i should add that as a question is suppressing more on the guys or on the ladies? Believe me, you would be surprised. 
<laughs> okay, so let's go to the chat box to see how many answers we got on that emotional intelligence question. Uncle Kenneth, while we are waiting to read out the answers and those who passed and those who failed, do you want to say something about managing or suppressing your emotion? Which of them would you rather do? Is Kenneth there? Hello, yes, I will, I'll rather manage, I'll rather manage. you rather manage? Yes. So would you say there have never been a time, there have never been a time that you had to suppress your emotion? Uh, definitely, I think it's, uh, I think it's the natural part of our masculinity to say, I don't want people to know I'm, I, I'm about to cry. Like when, uh, when uh, answers didn't succeed like we thought it would. Mm -hmm. Or oh, I'm about to, uh, I'm, I'm, very, I'm extremely upset and angry in a, in a corporate situation where you don't want to be seen as as uh, unable to control yourself and all that. Yeah, but generally, I think the right thing to do is to manage your emotions. Okay, so let's see. I have one, two, three. Okay. Okay, so I have three persons. The answers, they answered on A, on A, right? They picked A, which is to manage. Then I'm sure the B, B was to suppress it, isn't it? <laughs> A, okay. Let me blow your mind, everyone. The truth is, the truth is those who answered B, which is to suppress your emotion, got it all right. <laughs> they got it all right. Yes, I had um, Shrivel, I had Kenneth say uh, the, the good thing is to manage your emotion. But the truth is in emotional, emotional intelligence, in our early days, we were taught to suppress our emotions. Believe me, even now, even as an adult, we still suppress our emotions. At some point, we still do that. You really can't help it but to suppress it. But the bad thing about suppressing your emotion is at some point when you eventually blow out and you are able to speak out, it may not, I mean, every, where you are may not contain you. That is the bad part of it. Okay, but... Um, we are all growing, learning to become better. Like we usually say, we are all a work in progress. So we keep learning, we keep on learning and relearning. It's always good to manage our emotions. But believe me, when you can't manage it, it's always good you suppress it. And one of those ways you can suppress your emotion is by, instead of blowing hot, 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 you could just go pick up a glass cup of water <laughs> and put water in your mouth. <laughs> By the time you have water in your mouth, you won't want to you know, say something while you have water in your mouth. It's as simple as that. Or better still, part of emotion, emotional intelligence also, instead of you, boy, you know, blowing hot, 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 you've been offended over issues and all of that, why don't you just take a moment, breathe in, breathe out. Think about the person who you think have offended you, right? Think about the best moments that both of you may have had in time past. Give him or her excuses. It's always good that we are able to give excuses for people's faults. Before we find faults on people, emotional intelligence says, and pardon me, I'm not an expert, I'm just saying one or two things I've learned so far. Instead of blowing, you know, bam, saying the things that you may likely regret at the end of, you know, the little fracas, 
think about the best moment you've had with someone. So Shrivel, do you want to say something? On emotions, suppressing okay. and managing um, emotions. Yes. An emotion suppressing. Have you ever suppressed your emotions, Trivial? Well, I think it. I think at, at any at every uh, different point in our lives, every one of us has suppressed the emotions at one point, and also managed them. As time goes by, and as we grow up, we learn that uh, sometimes we learn just how to manage emotions, maybe by keeping quiet. Mm -hmm. and uh, commenting or talking about it later when you've uh, sat down and thought about all the okay, facts. Ladies, 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 sorry to interrupt. Um, the, the big man is here. Um, so I'm, I'm going to go ahead to introduce um, the keynote speaker first. The keynote address. And then after we will take the guest speakers. Um, like I did mention before, I want to, it is my honor, privilege to want to welcome um, a man I call the big, the big Iroko. You know that the but when you now add the big Iroko to it, you should understand what that means. So I want to introduce Professor Ndubiseke. Okay, Professor Ndubiseke started his excellent career right from his high school days where he attended the secondary technical school and set an extraordinary record by obtaining eight distinction. He then proceeded to the Federal University of Technology where he earned a bachelor degree in electrical engineering and graduated as his class best student. Professor Ndubiseke holds four master's degree that's the kind of big Euroco we are talking about. Alongside two doctorates in management from St. Clement University of Electrical and Computer Engineering, where he specializes in electro and microelectronics and medical robotics engineering from John Hopkins University, USA. Some of his research work involved the manufacturing of integrated cycles with the application of alternative energies by biomedical engineering, medical robotics and neuromorphic engineering. Professor Ekekwe is a US semiconductor industry veteran and has served in the United States National Science Foundation Engineering Research Center, and the committee. He's a co-chairman of Jet Proportion Laboratory, JPL Financial Group, California-based financial advisory firm that syndicates capital for projects in Africa. He developed a special technique of controlling and monitoring the mastery of medical robot use Pervasive surgeries in, 19, in 2017, the United States government got a signing right to the patent. Professor Kekwe is certified in key fields in technology and has to his name, high ranking publication and technical papers, which are rated among the leading journals and conferences on technology. Amongst other accomplishments, so numerous to mention, Prof, like I call him, sits as part of selection board member of the $100 million to the main entrepreneurship program. Prof. Ekekwe is the founder and lead faculty of the African Institution of Technology, Tekidia Institute Mini MBA that specializes in Mini MBA and also, of course some other programs like the Advanced Diploma and also the College Board that they do, that they do for students undergraduates. An institution that promotes practical education, supporting facilitates and enactment of technology policies and enables the bottom up creative in technology originating from African economics. Professor Kekwe is a renowned speaker and author who writes for the Harvard Business Review. He has been doing this since 2009. Professor Kekwe with Tequila Institute is number one on the list of YouTube, um, of um, YouTube brother, global partners. And his top most interest is to see the potential of youth being fully maximized. That's the very reason we are extremely glad, I myself, extremely glad to have him, to have him deliver this keynote address. Because Prof understand the power of collaboration and partnership. And that's why this, this team in collaboration for social impact, roles of youth and organizations or social enterprises makes sense that he has to deliver the keynote as this. On behalf of the Youth of Global Leadership, special guests and participants, Prof, I'm very pleased to welcome you as to deliver your keynote address. 
We'll come on stage first. So thank you so much, uh, distinguished uh, ladies and gentlemen. But I uh, let me just uh, apologize for making it here a little bit late. But uh, observing all protocols, I would like Vivian and her team to continue the conversation uh, they were having. Uh, it's not ethical and morally right for me to just interject. Please, Vivian, I understand that you had a section you are working on. Uh, please, can you, will it be possible for you to finish answering the questions? And as soon as you finish, I can come in. I apologize that I made it a little bit here late. And uh, please just, Vivian, my apologies that we had to interject your section just because of, uh, of mine. So please finish it up. Once you are done, then I can share whatever I have for the community. Thank you so much, gentlemen and ladies. Thank you so much, Prof. It's such an honor to have you. So the session I was on um, has to do about emotional intelligence. I had asked a question that has to do with it. Um, when we, you, we were all young, which of these would you say that your parents taught you? Is it to manage your emotions or to suppress them? And then I asked them, I asked the participants to put in their answers on the chat box. Prof, we had three persons answer A. And A option is to manage your emotion. And then B is to suppress it. I said, I, I was just um, out from a particular session, I mean, on emotional intelligence also. We taught, we were taught so much about emo emotional intelligence. I went on, jumped, right there to say, look, I was taught to, <laughs> to manage my emotions. Look, at the end of the day, we were so many that failed the question. Why? Because if you want to be pragmatic and very truthful to yourself, our parents didn't teach us how to manage our emotions. Even right now, if you want to be truthful to ourselves, it's a bit difficult at some point to get to manage your emotions. Yes, we are all learning, we are growing as, as, a, as adults. You keep growing and learning how to manage it. But the first thing that comes to your head naturally is to suppress it. It's to suppress it. Is it that you want to put water in your mouth or you want to reflect back? Uh, if I, you know, in one minute, you want to just think, if I do this and blow hot like this, what will be the outcome? At that point, you're obviously suppressing your emotion. Now, um, the other people, about five of them answered B. They got it correctly because it's the, it's the answer. We were taught to. And then permit me to also read out people's comments. Hussein Hamza said to me, I don't think we can manage emotions, but we can only suppress it because it's natural. Isaac Bukola says, I support you, Vivian. I mean, it's just a temporary thing. I don't know what she's talking about here. I, I guess probably it's a temporary thing to suppress, right? Or maybe to manage. I don't know. And then Isaac, um, Isaac, Isaac, Isaac's son or Isaac's son or Konkwa or something. Can I read the name? I don't know the name. I can't see the name fully. This person says, what if there is no best moment at all? Say the person has always been disrespectful. So you had to blow hot, isn't it? <laughs> That's someone's comment. And then this other person, Isaac again, Bukola says, when we are objective and we try to emphasize with those we are working with, it will be easier for us to suppress our emotions. And then informer Enyisi says, I think suppressing emotions is a part of managing our emotions. These are all wonderful comments. Okay, that will be all, sir. That will be all. I have read everybody's comments on that my session. Thank you so much, Prof. <laughs> For allowing you. the session to finish. Please go on, sir. Okay. Thank you so much. And thank you, distinguished uh, ladies and gentlemen. 
Um, my name is Ndubisi uh, Ekeko. Okay, it's quite a moment and privilege to have the opportunity of coming here to have a conversation with uh, young people on how to drive collaboration and examine impacts in market systems. So let me just begin by sharing a slide here and that we can take it off from there. Uh, okay, so, um, so the I'll title it the youth of nations and called into the future. If you go around the world, there are so many perturbations, there are so many challenges, there are so many frictions that nations, communities, and people are facing. And if you look through all these challenges, one thing is evident that the promises of that future will be and will come when young people rise up to do that thing that is necessary to fix those frictions and bring those perturbations back to mercy. So how do we look into how those things have happened over the years? I'll show you a little plot of the GDPs of nations over the last 2000 years. And you could see that nations rise, nations fall. At the time, one of the most dominant economies in the world was China. At the time was India. At the time was United Kingdom. At the time, America. Now, China is back. So what is going on here is that there is never a state where everything is in a state of stasis. People, individuals, communities, nations, they continue to rise and they continue to advance. And if you look at the rise of nations, there is a clear correlation on the rise of young people. When you look at young people like Tenige, B.Y. Melon, Rockefeller, look at even Dan Gote, look at uh, Chino Achebe, look at Wosho Inka, look at some of the people that have changed our generations, the generations past, we realize they actually did most of those things when they were very, very young. So when we are looking for the change that we want, it's also very critical for us to understand that as young people, we are actually the change that we want to come. And that's what former president of the United States say that you are the change that you are looking for because we are the instruments, we are the vehicles upon which some of those things and vistas, opportunities that we want to come into the future we come. So everything that we want, the economic opportunity, having food security, having a very amazing community where we live, having families, having just opportunities in jobs, we also have to play a very critical part. And as we are living in our time also, especially in some parts of the developing world, we see that a ramping up population is rising up. There's so many issues, but one thing has remained constant, that when the human spirit the people that they can deepen their capacity, bringing processes and tools that we can actually solve any, any problem that we have. Let me show you this plot just before. And this plot here, I, I put it across in a post in Harvard. And one of the things I was trying to explain there is that if you look around more than 2000 years of GDP, you see that for more than 1,500 years, that the, that the gross world product, in other words, if you combine the GDPs of nations, was largely flat. The GDP of the United States of America around this time to this time was flat. The GDP of China at the same time was flat. But after a period of time, something began to change. That linear phase of their growth, that linear phase of their GDP now started moving exponentially. That a nation that saw a flattening GDP over centuries started seeing a growth that was more than exponent, that was more than quadratic. So the question here is this, in Africa, in Nigeria, across different communities and cities, how can we now move from this stage of our lethargic GDP growth or economic opportunity growth to the one that will become a little bit exponential? It goes back to looking at some of the most fundamental things in market systems, about the numbers, ability to use numbers, ability to make sense of things, ability to also organize the factors of production. And then when we are now looking at it, we see how do we collaborate as a people? How do we come together as a people? How can even the young people and social enterprises bring that necessary leadership that we want them to be? If you go back to the Greek philosophers, then when they were debating, the most fundamental aspects 
of our universe. Cow said that the world was made up of water. You know, that was everything on earth. You could turn it into water. Heraclitus would say the world was made of fire. But I have always zeroed on what Pythagoras said. He said that the world is nothing but numbers. The world is nothing but numbers. It means that the business of humanity is nothing but business of numbers. And a result of it across human history, we'll be looking at how we can actually make sense of numbers. We we'll build the abacus, build the slide rule, build the computational system, microprocessor systems that can make it possible for us to understand the numbers of everything we do. So in the social enterprises, in the youth ecosystem, how are we applying numbers in things we do? Because you cannot be talking about collaboration if you do not understand the numbers around whatever you are doing. If you do not use the numbers, you cannot improve your capacity. You cannot measure where you are. And because you cannot measure where you are, you cannot advance the processes that help you to do whatever you are doing. At the end of everything we do, it comes down to having that critical part, that elemental constructs of bringing demand and supply. Either you're an NGO, either you're a social service enterprise, either you're a bank, either you're a restaurant, it's all about offering service. And if you're offering service and you want to make it more efficient, you want to make it more impactful, you have to bring a kind of a better equilibrium point, how that demand and supply can come into play. If I can use example of a restaurant, NWC has just landed in Lagos. There is no part here, it doesn't have a family member. And let's also assume there is no restaurant where I can eat food. I have only one option. I have to begin to knock at every door in Lagos looking for somebody who has food to serve. At the same time, I'm knocking at every door in Lagos looking for somebody who has food. There is also that propensity that somebody has food. I can't find him. And because of that breakdown of information, he knows he has food. I know I'm hungry, I'm looking for him, he's looking for me, but we cannot come into an equilibrium point. You know, it's very risky. I can actually be looking for food and I will just even for them because I'm very hungry. So somebody will say, let me start up a restaurant the next day. So the next time DBC is looking for where to eat food in Lagos, he goes to a restaurant instead of looking and be knocking at every door. That individual who has started at that business called a restaurant has fixed a friction in the market by making it possible that I don't have to be knocking at every door. I can just go straight to that restaurant to eat food. And that's the same thing we are doing even when we are running social enterprises. We are trying to make it possible that we can bring demand and supply into a very perfect equilibrium point so that they can come together in one place and we can deliver service. Because at the end of all, we want to fix frictions in that marketplace. I am thinking in this way because I want even the social enterprises to understand that they have a call to duty and that call to duty requires that they have to fix that vision that they want to fix. It's not just that we have so many NGOs in Medugri and yet people are going through challenges. It's not just that they have many NGOs and communities yet we cannot measure the impact they have. It's only understanding that they have an obligation, that they have to actually measure their impact. And one way of measuring their impact is to see how they have overcome the frictions that they said they were coming to overcome. So the theme of this program is collaboration for social impacts. You want to see how you can have better impacts as you begin to do whatever you're doing within the NGO and the social impact communities. But I can tell you there is absolutely no way you can have that social impact if you do not measure whatever that you are doing. Because the only way you can improve is only when you know where you are. And that is what I call you. Going back to that constellation of Pythagoras, look at your numbers, look at the impact you are making. And when you have seen the impact you're making, look at the people driving those impacts, Look at the processes you are using and look at the tools. By constellating these three components, you can keep improving. And when you can keep improving, the society that you are serving will now begin to have a better result and they will begin to appreciate what we are doing. And if we do that, many beautiful things will begin to happen. Then how can we improve? How can we have better impacts? It goes back to those elemental pillars everything that we do in our society. Knowledge, 
having that entrepreneurial capitalistic mindset, having a, a need of seeding innovation society and then bringing efficiency in our labor systems. If you go back, you one thing that is evident is that when people have knowledge, beautiful things happen in their communities. You know, they, they say that today in most parts of Africa that we cannot just get things done. And I can also say there is a massive correlation that when our educational systems began to actually go down negatively, that was the time that we could not solve our problems. You know, when they say they are making COVID-19 vaccines, people would think that these things are Hollywood, Nollywood. But if you go back, even in 1960s, the first cholera vaccine in Nigeria was developed in Nigeria, but Professor uh, 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 Obi. So what I'm saying here is that when the people have knowledge, they will have impacts. And if you are running a social enterprise, if you deepen your knowledge capacity, one thing that will become evident is that you can actually have a variety. So I want you to go back to see how that acquisition of knowledge becomes extremely critical in whatever you do. You know, they say that when Moses appeared before the Israelites in the Bible, that they marvel because he has studied on the field. Because the best educational system in the world was man, and, and it was actually managed by Egypt, by Pharaoh. So Moses has studied with the best. And when he came, his compatriots saw him as a very knowledgeable man. And one thing happened that when Egypt had the best educational system, Egypt had the best global economy. From the time of the Egyptians to the time of the Babylonians, to the time that you can talk about the Roman empires, one thing has been a constant. The knowledge of a people put them into a better competitive position. The best of America today is not because they build good bonds. The best of America is because they have some of the finest university systems in the world that whatever comes to America, whatever challenges that they face, one thing is evident. They have the knowledge capacity to overcome those problems. If we do not invest in the accumulation and the capacity to adapt to knowledge systems, we cannot advance. So I want us to see that the mechanism of that impact we come from own ability to acquire knowledge because the empires of the future will be through knowledge. You can't give what you do not have. If you go into coast Ireland, looking around the Mediterranean Sea from in Greece, you will see the shipping lines that the Greeks built as they were leading the world in human and natural philosophy during the time of Aristotle, during the time of Socrates, during the time of Heraclitus. So they led the world in knowledge and they also led the world in comets because the shipping lines, they built them. And then having the pioneering spirit of moving from think tank to do tanks, you need to have the pioneers. That is how we can now have the impacts in our society. It's not about just writing journal papers, writing papers, telling people this is the way it has to be done. It also goes back, how can we become the pioneers as young people to translate those ideas into products and services that people can buy? B. White Melon, Men, Rockefeller, Kenigi, and you can also look into Africa, you see like men like Jimovia, the Lumelu, Dangote, the Strive, Wats, Wauf, Zambias, and so many of them. These are people that are pioneering market systems. And why young people need to join into that club. And when we do that, we have to remember that everything that man or woman will build, that the human efficiency of labor will remain a very critical element for us to advance. So as we measure our impact, how we want us to challenge ourselves, how are we improving at least on three of these components? Because they are critical in us, in the formulation, of those uh, evidence of factors of production. There are so many things that we can have impacts on agriculture, healthcare, real estate, education, technology. Today, Africa is extremely underperforming as a continent. And using Nigeria specifically, we are underperforming as a people. If you look at the Nigerian GDP, it's absolutely unbelievable that some of the finest group of people in the world, we cannot even have more than 500 billion. How can you have a population of 200 million people and you have a GDP of less than 500 billion? 
when America of around 320 billion peaks up to 30 trillion. If you look and work the numbers, you see that the optimal GDP of Nigeria should naturally be at least $6 trillion. What that means is that if we are actually $6 trillion, it means every opportunity you see in the land, we are going to have at least a multiple of at least two. It means we have more banks, opportunity banks, more opportunities in, in the fintechs, more opportunities in agriculture, because everything will be multiplied by a factor of, of 12. But because we have not done what we have to do as a people, that is the reason why in a land of abundance, we are still looking for how to do basic things. So agriculture is a promise. And if we get it right, we are going to unleash massive level of impact in our communities. And how can we unleash impact in our, through agriculture? It means we have to use new knowledge systems in agriculture. So look at healthcare services, look at the education and look at technology. These things are there for us to fix. And the most fascinating part is what I'll call the real estate sector. You know, let's assume magically you make me a governor in a state in Nigeria. You wish, and I wish. <laughs> you know, one thing I will do is that all the people in the villages, I'm gonna make them very rich people. How will I do that? I will get some startups in Lagos, get some startups in Kanu, get some startups in Portacot, get some startups across all our major state capitals. And I'll ask young people, go into rural areas in our community, go and document who owns each of those lands, houses and farmlands that we have. Record them in a ledger, in a database, and let's populate them in a government database. When we populate them in a data government day, you know what happens? The lands will now become part of our balance sheet as a state. When the land become part of the balance sheet in a state, they become instruments that the owners of those farm lands can now use to go to the banks and take credit. No nation in the world has developed that property rights. If you go back to this plot, something happened here. America stayed more than 1,500 years without no growth. But right in 1790, they, they offered the first property rights to Samuel Hopkins. And when they did that, the next three years, a growth that was linear started moving exponentially. The same thing happened in China. They ignored it for centuries, but the day they did their own, their growth started. One, it's, even if you go to the United Kingdom, I have many copies of this plot, you can always see that the advancement of property rights have always unlocked compounded leverageable factors in the prosperity of a people. Because a woman that inherited or from the husband or a man that inherited land from the parents in Nigeria, we say that that person is poor. That person is poor because that 1,000 acre of land is not in our balance sheet. Go to your village. He has 100 hectares of land. He is very poor. He cannot afford oh, you to send, send, send. He cannot afford to send his children to school because he doesn't have money. But if that land is in a balance sheet, he can sell it, he can sell a part of it, and he can have access to it. So we can deal on these constructs. And if we do, many beautiful things and opportunities will begin to happen. And I'm hoping that young people will begin to see the catalytic impacts of some of those elemental systems that we have to fix. And as we do that, impact will come and beautiful things will come. And I'll say this, as we do these things, we need to think different. Let's not look at social enterprises from the whole whole construct. I have to do it the way they did it last two years, last 10 years. No, let's not think about meeting the needs, meeting the expectation, but let's go into the perceptions of the communities we serve. You know, I like to say this because you may say this is for the for-profit companies. No, it's not for profit companies. The way we deliver social enterprise services, the ways that the NGOs work can actually have very big impact in how society is function. You know, people say, go beyond the needs, go beyond the expectation and go up to the level of perception. And what do I really mean by this? Essentially saying, you have to deliver services 
at, at, the, at the higher level. And, and when you deliver it to your society. And it is when we do that, the promises will come. And the promises, we can see them from the lagoons of, of Lagos to, to the mangrove of Calabar. And you can also see those promises from the grassland of Yobe to the savannah regions of Sokoto. You can see them from the plateaus of Jos to the rainforest of Oweri. That you can feel the impact from, 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 from the, the, the mangrove area of Cape Town to, to the beautiful atlas of Morocco. And you can move north and south, east and west. We can come back to an African continent and specifically also within the Nigerian space of a place that is hopeful, that everyone can connect because we can build things that will have catalytic impacts to drive the wealthy of our citizens because we can create the future we want by building it, and because we want to create it, we can predict it with certainty. Thank you so much, ladies and gentlemen, for the opportunity to speak. Thank you. Thank you very much, Prof. Thank you. Thank you. We are so grateful. We're so grateful. I have learned a whole lot. Thank you for impacting me. I think only me. I don't know about <laughs> that, but thank you, sir. Thank, thank you very much. You. Yeah, Harald is saying he himself it, it as well. Can, it can't be only you, Vivian. You can't <laughs> customize, you can't customize this. <laughs> what is it about Dr. Faye? <laughs> okay. Okay, so moving on. We are going to go right in. Um, please. Um, is it all right, Dr. Faith, that Prof answers a few questions on the chat, boss? Is it all right? Can yes, he? Yes, yes, ask? yes, yes. He's, 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 he's standby. Prof will always do that. Uh, okay. <laughs> yeah. Okay. That's right. Okay. Okay. So with me here, I have. Um, it's, that, it's not a question yet. It's starting off with a commendation and appreciation to Paul. This person says, um, you nailed it, Prof. You Thank nailed you. it, Prof. <laughs> Hussein Hamza says, you nailed it, Prof. <laughs> <laughs> And Sabo Yakubu says, we are the change we are looking for. I grab this. Part of those profs said, part of those then snipers, you know, prof said, Yakubu got this one. And Yakubu also says, when people have knowledge, beautiful things begin to happen. Trivial says, how can we become the pioneers as young people to convert the ideas to products and services that are actually consumable? A good concern. And this is a question to you, Prof. Yes, absolutely. And uh, let me answer that question uh, from using this plot. Uh, just because of my, the fact that I came here late, so I actually made this thing a little bit uh, faster. So if you look at this plot, uh, looking at specifically the answer to the question, I divided this plot into two phases. The time before here, I called it the invention society era in the world. The invention society was the time in our lives, in our societies where there were so many ideas. People were just writing papers, talking about ideas, and now, at this, the right-hand side after here is what I call the innovation society era. The innovation society is a society where instead of just talking about ideas, there are now products and services. If you look at the gross world products, aggregate of all the GDPs in the world, you realize that why United States, Western Europe, China have moved from the invention society era to the innovation society area. Africa is still stuck in the innovation society era. What does that really mean? What it means here is that if you go to Lagos today, you see some people in Molo and the motor parks. And if you go to Kenya, you see people in the beer palace. They tell you how they will solve every problem in Africa. Bring electricity problem, they have an answer. Bring clean water, they have an answer. Bring healthcare problem, they have an answer. 
But give them one year, two years, three years, four years, there is no solution. So in the inventive society era, there are more ideas, but you don't have products and services. And, but in the innovation era, you have products and services, not just ideas. So for young people, the biggest problem is how to transition your community from an invention society era to innovation society. Because it's only in the innovation society that you have products and services. So people that lived here were very brilliant people. Some of the most fundamental constructs in physics, mathematics, and chemistry, they were created by people that lived here. But there was a problem. When polio came, they died. When tuberculosis came, they died because they could not transform the compounds into vaccines. So they couldn't have products, even though they had the idea. But in this time, the people that live here did not just have compounds, they also made vaccines and they lived. So we have to do whatever we have to do to move from just giving ideas into creating products and services. And that is where that entrepreneurial capitalist mindset I mentioned, becoming not just knowledge elements, but also pioneers who can now transform those ideas into products and services. Because at the end of the day, if people are looking for those ideas in the market and they cannot buy products, there is nothing that will happen. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Prof. So let me go on um, with the, um, it's more like um, a thank you note. More of them, uh, you know, a lot of them here are thank you notes. Hassan Farah says, very interesting concept, land being part of our balance sheet. Hassan Hamza say, Hussein, sorry, I beg your pardon. Hussein Hamza says, thank you very much, Professor Ndubisi, for the educative, informative, and insightful presentation. And um, I, is it, I think it's Isaac Son says, you cannot give what you don't have. Um, okay, Hassan Farah also said, I have never seen an educative and informative session than this. Onyadili, many thanks, Prof. Ndubisi. Isaac Bukola says, thank you very much, sir, for this new knowledge and insight. I was expecting, I wasn't expecting less. Oluwa Yemi says, thank you, Prof. Well articulated. And PP Shreyas says, Prof, if I may ask, where do you see Africa in the next 10 years? Ooh, good question. <laughs> okay. Um, actually, you know, I'm, I'm a natural optimist. I, I, I have this optimistic exuberance that the world, and including Africa, will be getting better. I, I think it's just my natural uh, way of life. So I have, I have a lot of promise uh, in the sense that the future has promises. And uh, many people know here that I'm, I'm one of the largest investor uh, community members in the startup world. I, I write a lot of checks to young people. In short, this afternoon, I'll be investing in seven companies. And so I will not be doing that if I don't have the belief that Africa is going to continue to rise. But my challenge is um, some of these young people we are giving money in Lagos, in Nairobi, in Ogadabu, uh, they are becoming rich in US dollars, they are millionaires in dollars. But the impact may not permeate across communities. So my, my question is that Africa has promises. The future is gonna be great. And we are going to see more unicorns, startups that are worth at least a billion dollars. I think we are estimating about by, by next year, we have about 23 startups worth at least a billion dollars. But what does that mean? Uh, does it mean that because 20 young people in Lagos are millionaires that everything is fine? No. So Africa in general will be fine, but I also want to say that we are going to see enormous challenges. The, the, the population growth continues to grow faster than our economic growth. And what that means is that per capita income is decelerated because when you have more people sharing little, or 
you see that there will be a lot of pockets of chaos and challenges, and that has already happened. But we will be fine uh, if we continue to push very hard. And but I'm, I think that um, things generally will be better. And I, I don't want to make that promise on the construct that political system has to be better. I'm assuming that nothing is just going to change from the political leadership. But I believe that young Africans, what they are doing in Lagos and Accra, trying to use entrepreneurial capitalism to rewire the architecture of Africa's economy, that technology will make it possible for them to overcome some of the frictions that we have expected the political leaders to overcome. So when you see a bank in Lagos that was started maybe three years ago, being valued more than seven banks that were started more than 30, 40 years ago. You see that there are promises that are there, but of course those promises may not positively affect everyone. And that is where we have a challenge. So I want to tell young people that Africa will continue to rise. Africa will continue to have a very promising future. Africa will continue to, uh, let, let me show you here if I can, uh, how even the Economist magazine over the last few years has transitioned from hopeless continent to aspiring continent to uh, abundant continent. So we cannot just think that these things will not happen. But for each one of us, it doesn't mean that everyone is gonna benefit. And that is where we have to pay a lot of attention as a people, thank you. Okay. Um, it's like, with a moderator It's like, let me just pick one so that I can make space for other people because I know there are others that are supposed to speak. How can we achieve growth for developing economies without harming the planet? Are there opportunities to still protect our planet and nature, but create wealth and, and growth? Of course, you know, this is really one of the most important questions that we have to answer as a people in our generation. Prof, How do we ahead. drive this? Yeah, yeah. Okay, okay. It's, our, it's like a moderator is back. How do we drive this growth without destroying our planet? And how do we bring that efficiency in the utilization of factors of production, even when we have to keep it for, for the future? It's a very great question. And it's also one that I believe that every one of us, not just at the in social enterprise space, but also in the for-profit space, we have to keep, keep that conversation. But as a graduate of the Johns Hopkins University, we are, everything we do is about the human system. You know, in, in Johns Hopkins University, even if you are studying mathematics, they want you to understand the mathematics of human bones, anything. So I want to believe that the business and anything we do in business, we have to ask, how would that affect our environment? How would that affect our social system? And I know that if we follow what the United Nations has put across diligently as a people, I think we have a very good chance that we can grow economically and also preserve our climate for, for the future of, of, of mankind. Thank you so much, gentlemen and ladies. Please let me let's let's make sure we allow other people in this panel and conversation to continue. Thank you for the invitation and do have a wonderful event in Utah Global Summit. Thank you and thank you very much. Okay. Um Prof. Yes, hello, I'm Prof. Yes. If you could hear me good. Yes, I can. Uh, I can. The, the truth is. Prof, don't do us like this. We know other people are waiting. You know, you're like a father. You're like a mentor. You are everything. And I come to all of us. So I understand you are concerned and very, very concerned about all that. Thank you so much for being like that. But there are also a few, um, two more questions I would really love to read out. Maybe okay. perhaps you could just take note of them. I read all the questions. Then you okay. can now respond to all of them. Okay. Thank you, sir. Okay. So Isaac Bukola said, sir, Nigeria is about $5.5 trillion below its expected GDP. Yes. And she, go, she goes on to say, that he, she, I think it's a she, she goes on to say, sir, the market reform of China in 1979 brought a chance also for you for US, as stated in the graph, this insight gives me hope to Africa too. But his question is, are we on the course or are we still far? If we are not, 
what are the major metrics we must achieve to begin this change? Yeah. I, I, and then, I, okay. I think, let me answer that before the second, if you have finished that. I think it's a very important question here. Okay, mm. sir. Yeah. Please go ahead. So, um, to be honest with you, uh, Nigeria and to a large extent, excluding South Africa, we are not on the right path of that. There has never been any nation in the world that developed without property rights. Property rights is essentially saying, I have the right to own my property, and I have the right to sell my property, and I have the right to buy property, and I have the right to own it. If you don't do that, what happens here is that market systems will not work efficiently. Let's, let's take, for example, if you live in Alaska, the United States, you could buy a land in New York. You don't have to physically go and see that land. All you need to do is to transfer the money and somebody will do the paperwork, people that are registered to do that. You have so much confidence that once that paperwork has been done and the documents delivered to you, that that land belongs to you unless, until you sell it. So the city records will be there for you that that land belongs to you. Now in Nigeria, somebody has land in Lake Oweri and somebody in Sokoto buys that land. Do you think that person in Sokoto has access to that land? <laughs> it's, not, it's not gonna happen. It's not gonna happen. And because of lack of property rights, even though the person in Sokoto has paid for it, the inability for the local ordinance to protect that investment in land will make it nearly impossible for what I have called the velocity of land to happen. In other words, ability for the Sokoto person to sell that land to somebody in, let's say, Ocean, uh, 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 Ocean State. Another, so Nigeria has not gotten to that point where these things can happen with ease because property rights are not there. And you know whom he hawks? He hawks the original owner of the land because only people within his own local community can buy land from him, making it nearly impossible for others that may have resources to actually participate. And if you cannot have that level of efficiency, it means you can have 1,000 acres of land and you still be considered a poor man. You know, you go back to your village, you see the people that government thinks that are poor. Somebody can have 500 goods and he's still poor. Somebody have 1,000 acres of land and he's still poor. Because he is poor because there is no record of that wealth within the Nigerian general ledger. But if that piece of land is in the balance sheet of Nigeria and the banking system captures it, that see, the grandparents of Vivian has 1,000 acres of land. It means that when the grandparents pass it to your own parents, they can see in that lineage, that, okay, that the father got 100 acres. That becomes a collateralized asset that can be used for him to take a loan, maybe to buy, or build or do something or whatever he wants to do. Or if you say, I want to sell only 10 acres, I have 100 acres. Ability to do that was actually the reason why the United States advanced. Ability to do that was also the reason why the Western Europe advanced. Ability to do that was also even Taiwan. When you go through, yeah, it's like, well, what are my books that won the IGA Global Book of the Year Awards? I tried to explain how nations like Argentina, Brazil, how they were able to use simple things to advance. But in Africa, especially in Nigeria, we are not even making any effort in that. And that is the reason why a man with 1,000 cows in Sokoto is still seen as a poor man. Before the banks, he can't have access to credit, even though he has 1,000 cows. So we have to fix that for us to have any promise of advancing that economic opportunity. Thank you. Thank you, Prof. And the next one is Isaac Son Okonkwa. Hello, Prof. Thank you yes, for- Yes, I'm here. Very... No, is the Isaac Son Okonkwa writing. Hello, Prof. Thank you for a very wonderful presentation. As a young mind, I believe we have all the knowledge there is to have in Nigeria. Young Nigerians are extremely innovative, but yet this knowledge haven't been properly utilized. And one of the limitation is finance. 
What are your recommendations going forward, sir? Can I, I absolutely. go on to the next one? Okay, go ahead to the next one. Yes, please. Okay, Daniela. Daniela says, we can achieve growth for developing economies without harming, or rather, how can we achieve growth for the developing economies without harming the planet? Are these opportunities, are these opportunities to still protect, oh, sorry, are there opportunities to still protect our planet and nature, but create wealth and growth? That's yeah. it, sir. Okay, awesome, thank you. I, I think that last one, I had already hinted on that. Uh, so we just have an obligation as a people. Interestingly, uh, the African Union and the world, United Nations, they have put us many protocols on how we can actually advance economic opportunity without harming the planet. But as we already know that global and climate change, these are multifaceted issues. You could try to do the right thing in Lagos when somebody's polluting in China, at the end of the day, you are the one that will get the brunt. So we just have to have global leadership. People have to come together and say, hey, we need to think in as much as we want to eat Amala Orikoi Koi today the way we want it. We also have to think about the future because if we destroy the world for the next generation, we will not say that we have done the right thing. So we, we have to do that. It growth, economic opportunity, and preserving our planet, these things can happen at the same time. And I do believe that we can do that. And I'll take you back to the Igbo apprentice system using that philosophy of Ubuntu, using that philosophy of stakeholder capitalism, where a man goes to the village and he gives out money to, for people to become his competitors. And, and when the, the people he has trained, they become his competitors, he is still happy. So the same thing applies. How can we build economic opportunity at the same time making sure we protect our planet. In this case, we don't see it as two different divergent things. Just like the man that goes to the village, he brings in young people, he raises them as competitors, releasing market share, using his money to fund his competitors. So the human spirit can work that way. And I believe that we have to fix it. Then on finance, of course, unfortunately, um, we don't, Africa has not built protocols to finance the visionaries of the future. And if you look into the startups that we have today, all this money that is flowing in and out, let me tell you one thing. Something happened about six years ago. The United States made it possible that anywhere you are in the world, you can incorporate a company in the United States. So you live in Lagos, you start up a startup in Lagos, and you can incorporate in Delaware, especially Delaware. That's where most of them now register. All these startups you see in Lagos that are raising millions, all of them are not African companies anymore. They are legally United States companies, but they are now having subsidiaries in Africa. So in other words, the wealth of the African continent through the entrepreneurs and startups are already Americans. But unfortunately, if you do not accept that, they will not invest in you. I, I'm really very sorry that I'm also part of the people doing this. And there is a reason for that. If we have $1 million we want to give you in Lagos and you register your company in the Corporate Affairs Commission in Abuja, I'll tell you, unfortunately, I must be honest here, I'm afraid of giving you that $1 million because in the night, you can actually go back to the government and manipulate the paper documents in Abuja, and then remove our name. So we don't have confidence in the property and intellectual property rights in Nigeria. And that is the reason why we say, for us to give you this 1 million, you have to reincorporate the United States where we think that the law works. So when you now reincorporate in America and we sign the paper document, we believe there is no way you can go to Delaware in the Secretary of State office and manipulate the paper document removing our name after we're giving you one million. So it goes back to that thing I told you, that you cannot advance faster than your property rights. And now let's assume there is a legal case. One person has a problem with another person. If you have a legal case at the level of the Supreme Court in Nigeria now, the earliest you can get an appointment is 2024. The first appointment is not on when the case will be resolved. 
the case will nearly take about two decades for it to be resolved. But in United States, if there is a case, you are sure that within six months, everything has been resolved. So if you are a venture capitalist, the life expectancy of your fund is typically within six to nine years. How can you invest in a place where it takes two decades for them to resolve a legal matter? So they said they don't want to invest in that place where it takes two decades to invest to resolve a legal matter. So if you really want this money, go and register in London or go and re-register in US so that if there are a legal case, we know that within six months, those things are solved. What are we talking about? It's still the same property rights, legal ordinance. And if you now remove those legal ordinance, you see that. So, so what is happening Why people are raising money is because there are now apparatus upon which the investors can actually put money in these companies and have confidence that nobody is going to skim them out in the night. If you block that, you won't see any money. And finally, with all due respect to M. K. Abiola, one of the richest men ever lived in Nigeria. I think the family is still fighting over his estate after how many decades he died. You know why? They don't even know the real copy of the registration of the documents in the Nigerian government database because they are now having so many copies. The, this family will say, no, this is the copy. They went to the one in government. People are saying, no, the one with the government is not the original. <laughs> so, so, so you see the issue. So when you are talking about people are not raising money, uh, finance, I say, who is going to give you money where you take money from me, you go and bribe one stupid government official, he replaces the document, he, really, he destroys the old one and people. So that's the reason why you, we have to actually in a way be grateful that people have figured out by going to Delaware and London, they can get the capital they need to develop in Accra, develop in Kenya, develop in Lagos. But it is going to cause massive problem in the next 10 years. Look at the Nigeria Stock Exchange. The largest companies in the Nigeria Stock Exchange were companies started around 1990s and 2000. In other words, after every generation, the stock exchanges refresh through as a result of creative destruction and innovation of funds. The largest company in the, in the United States Stock Exchange in 1917 was US Steel, was the largest company in 1917 in US Steel. 50 years later, the largest company in the United States Stock Exchange was IBM, that was in 1967. Today, the largest is Apple. So you could see how a construction cement company, steel company, moved to technology company, infrastructure to a knowledge company. In Nigeria, it follows the same pattern. Today, the largest companies we have are like Bua Cement, uh, Dankote Cement, Bua Fu. But the company that should be the largest in Nigeria in the next 30 years, they are not even Nigerian anymore. Because they are being incorporated in London and New York. Unlike GT Bank, let, let, let me not depress people here, but I will say here, election is coming in 2023. Please go and vote for the right people. Don't vote for people that give you 500 naira because we need leaders that can think. That is the only way we can save this country. The companies we are celebrating in Lagos are not Nigerian companies anymore. And that is the reason why people can give them money to go and do business in Lagos, but Nigerian people may not benefit because most likely, they are not going to be listed in Nigeria. Imagine if all the banks, GT Bank, Zeni Bank, the largest banks in Nigeria today in Nigeria are not are non Nigerian banks. That would have been a massive erosion of value in the Nigeria Stock Exchange. That is going to happen with all these new startups because you will not see them anywhere in Nigeria over the next 20 years. Thank you so much, gentlemen and ladies, for the opportunity of participating in this academic festival. Thank you and have a great conference and event. Thank you so much and bye bye. <laughs> okay. Thank you so much, Prof. And then let me use the opportunity to also just read out what the um, Harold Graham is the next speaker. All right. And he said something interesting Nigeria could be the first country to decentralize, eliminating central banks, adopting cryptocurrency, and leveraging blockchain to establish property rights. 
Thank you, thank you, thank you, Harai. Thank you, sir. And um, at this juncture, may I please pass the ball to my co-moderator, Shreville, to please introduce Harald. Thank you. Is Shreville there? Hello? Can she hear me? <laughs> okay. Well, I'm here if you can hear me. <laughs> yes, I can see you. I can see you, Sahara. I can see you clearly. Well, okay. I'm, <clears throat> I'm hoping my mic is working. Yes, it is. I can hear you loud and clear, sir. Excellent. Thank you. Yes, uh, I don't right. really need an introduction. It's it's all good. I can I can uh, I can provide my own introduction if that's okay. Uh, oh, okay. I, I object. Let's introduce the you. Her. <laughs> okay, <laughs> okay, 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 fine. Uh, okay, okay. So please, uh, Sahara, kindly just um hold on a bit. Let me introduce it to, to our audience. Okay, so. Saharaid Graham, with a personal motto, pursue something so important that even if you fail, the world is better off with you having tried. End of quote. Harold Graham is the CEO of Social Impact Investment and an advisory board member at Omega Point Partners alongside being known as a registered securities and commodities broker lead at H.W. Graham and Associates, an investment banking, fundraising, corporate development, and political consulting firm based in Orlando. During his 25 year plus career, he served as a strategic business consultant and investment banker. He developed strategic marketing campaigns and, and distribution partnerships with companies of all sizes. In addition, Saharaid beheaded successful fundraising campaigns on behalf of corporate and philanthropic entities. Harold's expertise also includes private placements involving equity and debt financing, raising seed growth and, and, and expansion stage capital, and acquisition financing for companies in various industries. He sourced alternative investments for individuals, institutions, and family and family offices. I take that again. So Harold sourced alternative investments for individuals, institutions, and family offices. He was registered with FINRA, that is F-I-N-R-A, and the NFA CFTC and Health Series 7 three and 63 registrations. In addition to social impact investment, Saharaid has also co-founded many other socially impactful companies. Ladies and gentlemen, it's such an honor to have Haroid join us to impact African youths today. We welcome you, sir. Please take the center stage. The thank microphone you, thank you. is all yours. I greatly, greatly appreciate uh, being asked to come here. I'm not sure how to make my, I, I guess you guys will handle bringing me to the center, but um, so I, it sounded really great. This, uh, the, the background, you know, when you read it all off, it sounds like I'm really super important, but uh, honestly, I, I'm just a sales guy. And um, whether you're selling politics or you're, selling finance or you're selling social impact it's still a matter of explaining things to people breaking down complex ideas into something that people can digest and then um, getting them to trust you and that's really what it comes down to and if if you can do that you can sell anything i mean it doesn't matter what you're trying to sell um i don't know how to make my picture the main one miss vivian i'm sorry um Let's see. Yeah, okay, so I'm just gonna get started. Um, 
I got started in finance when I was in my 30s. And um, I did fundraising for philanthropy. These are organizations that are trying to do good. Um, I eventually gravitated more toward uh, the startup world uh, because uh, finding money for startups, you get paid a lot better than you do finding money for, uh, you know, companies that are trying to do good or, or, or charities. So um, I made a lot of money raising money for startups. Uh, where I did that for about uh, close to 20 years. And I'm, I made a lot of money. And then ultimately, I met an investor one day who I was pitching for a number of different clients of mine at the time. And he asked me a question that stopped me in my tracks. And the question was, what 